her all the way around, please. Where are you from? You think it's from East, somebody from East London settled there? We call it East London. The area you just walked down I refer to as Water Lane. The reason being, before this outer wall was built, the River Thames would lap up against that wall behind you. The bloody tower as we know it today was the waterway entrance into the Tower of London. When you walk through here, look on your left hand side, you can still see one of the old iron rings where they used to tie the boats up to. But of course, when they built this outer wall, they drained this area, raised it to its present level. It still retains the name Water Lane. Behind me, one of the most famous gates in the world, Traitor's Gate. It used to be known as Watergate. Well, I can see Mary, it's very excited. <laughs> because we had it first. Our two leaks. But never mind, in the reign of King Henry, he built a straight wall from the west to the east. But the king decided he wanted a safe waterway entrance from the tower. So he knocked this part of the wall down. And he made the area where you're now standing into a small harbour. So on a full tide, his boats and barges could come right into the tower, unload its safety without hindrance. Now he's got a problem. Got a big wall on that side, a big wall on that side, and a big hole in the middle. Not a very good idea for a defensive wall. So his son, King Edward I, he ordered this tower to be built to protect this waterway entrance. It was called Watergate. Why did the name change to Traitor's Gate? This is because of all the alleged traitors that were brought into the Tower of London via this waterway entrance. We know there were hundreds, but I'll mention just a few. Queen Anne Boleyn, Queen Catherine Howard, Lady Jane Grey, Sir Walter Raleigh, Sir Thomas More, the seven bishops, would be met here by the gentleman jailer and then escorted to their cells to await their fate. Sometimes, just a few steps to the block and the axe on the green. Or, as I said earlier, they had to walk out of the Tower of London, up there, onto Tower Hill. Behind you, the bloody tower. It used to be called the Garden Tower because it gave access and it overlooks the lieutenant's gardens. But because of all the crimes that were committed inside, the names changed to the Tower of Blood and then the bloody tower. It was here by tradition in 1485 the two young princes were murdered. Edward V, aged 13, and Richard, the Duke of York, his younger brother. They were brought here in preparation for Edward's coronation. While they were here, they disappeared. 191 years later, some workmen who were repairing the staircase, they found a casket. In the casket were the remains of two small boys. The authorities at that time said these must be the two young princes. On the orders of King Charles II, they were removed from the Tower of London to Westminster Abbey and reburied in Innocent's Corner. The Duke of Gloucester, who was the man responsible for bringing the two boys here, became better known as King Richard III of England, who only a few months ago was found under a car park in Leicester. The Plantagenet is covered up and left him. Hoping never to be found. But there we, there we go. History keeps on moving on, doesn't it? It's a strange thing to see, isn't it? So Walter Torali was in prison here for over 13 and a half years. Now you probably know. He was a very good friend of Queen Elizabeth I. He was a professional pirate against the Spaniards. He named Virginia and the Carolinas, but the Queen died. There were no natural heirs to the throne, so they asked King James VI of Scotland to become King James I of England, and Sir Walter Raleigh disagreed with this. So it should have been the king's cousin, Arbel Assured. He was found guilty of high treason. The punishment for high treason in those days was to be hung up by the neck until nearly dead. Taken down, as they were gasping for breath, opened up in the sign of the cross, disemboweled, and the parts burnt on a small brazier beside them, beheaded, and the body cut into four quarters, hanged, drawn, and quartered. Well, I think more Mel Gibson myself. But <laughs> you're quite right. Sir William Wallace, the Scottish knight, Sir William Wallace, brought here. We do not know where he was held, but he was taken to Smithfield, 
is our meat market. That's where he was hanged, drawn and quartered for Baptist Walter Raleigh. He had so many friends in those days, the king was trying to execute him. So he was sent here to the Bloody Tower. He was one of those prisoners that was allowed to walk freely around the tower until he had the curfew bell. He had to return to his cell to be accounted for. His wife used to visit every day. She decided to live with her husband. A lot of my colleagues feel this was part of the punishment. <laughs> you married. That's why you laugh so hard. <laughs> if your wife was here, you wouldn't laugh like that. <laughs> a more mature gentleman, just a nice smile. <laughs> These women who decided to live with their husbands. Hello. These women who decided to live with their husbands, they also became prisoners. And they were not released until their husbands were released or their husbands were executed. In the case of Sir Walter Raleigh, he was released to go to the Orinoco in South America to find El Dorado, the city of gold. He came back penniless. He was found guilty of the crimes 15 and a half years before. Taken to the old palace yard at Westminster, where he was beheaded. It's a very sad end to such a famous man. Now before we leave this area, I'll just point out a couple of things. If you want to go into the wall walk, remember you're standing between the bloody tower and Traitor's Gate. The entrance is up these steps. It takes you through St. Thomas's, over the Sullivan Bridge, into the upper part of the Wakefield Tower, onto the wall to the north side where it ends with an exhibition of the types of animals that were kept in the town. Oh, let's go to the gate here. Jack! Hello. We are now standing in the inner ward. Behind me is the White Tower, also known as the Norman Keep. This is the fortress that was built for King William I of England. He wanted to overawe the people of the city of London. He thought that if he could control the city, then he would control the rest of England. The architect was a monk from Beck in Normandy. His name is Gundolf. He later became the Bishop of Rochester. Commenced in 1078, it took 20 years to build. It stands 92 feet high. The walls taper from 15 feet thick at the base to 12 feet thick at the top. There are three square turrets and one round. The round one is around the corner, on the northeast corner. And it was here that the first Royal Observatory was placed, before it went down to Greenwich. On top of each turret is a weather vane surmounted by a crown on the weather vane. There we are. It's the Royal Coat of Arms which denotes. Even to this day, this is a royal palace. But the kings and the queens stopped living here around about the year 1605. If they were here, they would have been on the top floor. Below them, the accommodation for their knights, their ladies, the banqueting house, the council chambers, the kitchen, and the kitchen staff. There is one more floor, which is partly below ground. And this was used as a storeroom. But of course, when they decided to torture people, that was the ideal place to do it. The walls been over 15 feet thick. Who would hear the screams and the moans of those unfortunate people? Today, this is very brightly lit. And just for you, the people that come and see us at the Tower of London, they've turned it into a shop. <laughs> That's the modern day instrument of torture for the gentle pie. It is probably the best Norman chapel you'll ever see it. It was in here that the following happened. Lady Jane Grey prayed for those nine days when she was the uncrowned Queen of England. Somewhere in the Tower of London at the moment, this is the first floor of the Wakefield Tower, King Henry VI was murdered while at prayer. So a scholarly king. He's the founder of King's College, Cambridge and Eton College. But it was in this chapel he lay in state. Here that Queen Mary married by proxy King Philip II of Spain. The King could not be bothered to turn up for his wedding. He sent a man called Count Egmont to take the vows for him. When the Queen died, the Pope at that time said that England belonged to Spain. 
And this is what started the Spanish Armada. It's here that the second oldest order of chivalry in England stems. It was tradition for the king and the queen, along with their squires, to pray all night during this vigil. The next day they'll process to Westminster Abbey for the coronation. But at a certain time during this vigil, the two knights would go next door, there'd be large tubs of water, and they would take a bath. As they were bathing, the king would come round and put the sign of the cross on their right shoulder. They became known as Knights of the Order of the Bath, the second highest order of chivalry in England. Behind me we show some very large black birds. One. are the largest birds of the crow family. They're called ravens. We must have six ravens here at all times, otherwise in England, the monarchy, the tower will collapse. This is serious. At the moment we have eight just in case. Now the flight feathers, not the wings, the flight feathers are clipped to make sure they do not fly over the walls. Of course they grow, so they keep on clipping them. It's a bit of ongoing progress. Every night, the Raven Master stands down by those cages. He whistles to these birds, they hop and hop down the hill, into the cages, where they are locked in for the night. They are the only prisoners left in the Tower of them. At the moment, the Raven Master is bragging. He is the only man who can whistle. You get eight birds into bed in ten minutes. <laughs> That is the entrance into the instruments of torture. Very popular with ladies and children. <laughs> but we are now going to go up there.